Hi, nice to see you. We haven't met. My name is Nash Warugoro, and I have the privilege of leading this incredible community of faith. And if, again, this is the first time you came at the perfect time, because other than uh, many things, today we get into start a new conversation, a new sermon series. Now, been telling Mothoni, my wife, that this is like literally my favorite season of the Christian faith calendar. You know, like I get the anticipation of like Christ going to the cross and everything else. But then like this time we meet after the grave has been declared empty, after Christ is walking and mingling around us. And I'm like, this season for me, the resurrection, the post-resurrection life is like my favorite space. So you can imagine I have been preparing for this sermon series almost since, I don't know, February. I was like, yeah, Easter is coming. And we'll get over Easter. And then it was going to be a moment when we get to meet after Christ is risen. And as a result of that preparation, I found myself in the book of Colossians. You know, this book of Colossians, like a very simple book. Literally, you can read it in one sitting. It's just four chapters long. It's just so beautifully, well articulated. Well thought out. I just thought this is where my favorite time of the current of the Christian calendar is going to be spent. But there's a bigger reason why I settled on the book of Colossians because at its heart, Korah's terror, the, the book was written to this incredible community of faith that was winning in so many arenas, but now they were facing almost two, two twin challenges. And one of the challenges they were facing is like this sense of, is Christ enough? Is Christ enough? And I guess these ordinary people, as they walked and moved and you know, interacted with their neighbors, you know, and now they have this newfound faith. They are excited about their faith. Very soon, they start bumping into the very realities of the world around them. They start asking, is Christ enough? And for this particular culture, the big thing that was tension was these people who would say, no, 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 you cannot say that Christ is enough because part of it is you're not Jew enough. You almost need to also become some form of a Jewish person so that you can tap into the fullness of the power of the newfound faith in Christ. So there were almost these philosophies that were saying you need to do something more over and above what your faith is. But also, not only that, in light of different persecutions, or other people who are saying, like, it's good that you have this new faith in Christ, and it's good that you are excited about going to heaven, but now, in this very real world that you are living, you need some other powers. Maybe you need to visit the resident witch doctor in the evening. Maybe you need to get the right cockerel to take with you. You may need to start seeing some powerful, more powerful person. Is Christ enough? And you would imagine that we have settled that question almost 2,000 years later. And the truth of the matter is we are so far from settling it in. And I think for a community like ours that is winning on so many levels, I thought that it's important that we come back and remind ourselves that the Christ who rose from the dead is enough. Even in 2024, is exactly who we need to navigate the terrain of life that we find ourselves in as it is here and now. The thing about it is I say that in English and you just go through your mind and you're like, of course, of course it's enough, right? What do you mean is not enough, you know? Until you start digging into the real life. And that's what the next couple of weeks are going to be about. Just us giving ourselves to join this community of faith as they read this letter as Paul has written it to them. And hopefully they are spending time trying to internalize what exactly it means and what exactly it is that it's saying to them. So that's what our journey is going to be over the next thing. The big question I want to keep throwing over and over back to you is, is Christ enough? Not as a mental accent. Not as something you say in a church context, but in a way that actually informs the very outworkings of your life outside of this space. Is Christ enough? Other times we answer that when we say, of course it's enough because I'm born again. Of course it's enough because I go to church. Of course it's enough because I give money to church. Of course it's enough because it's a part of my thing. But then if you watch a lot of our actual lived lives, the very fruits that we bear, and Jesus made our faith so difficult by saying, it's not about mental accent. It's not about saying, I am born again and weeping and doing that. That's a good starting point. But he says that you shall know them by their fruits. 
I guess the question I'm really after this morning or this next couple of weeks is the fruit you are bearing a reflection of a Christ who is enough? Or is the fruit you are bearing with your very life as you do your business, as you parent, as you date and be in relationship with one another, is it actually a testament to something else? That Christ is enough and something else added on top. This is really challenging because I don't think any one of us here wonders if Christ is enough. And that's a foundational question we struggle with. And for a lot of us, it's a question of it's Christ and something else. It's Christ and a good job. Or at least it's Christ who leads to a good job. It's Christ who leads to a healthy marriage. It's Christ and some material world. It's Christ and something else. That's what we call the fullness of Christ. So it's amazing that to our people who these guys are literally at the very beginnings of being persecuted. So they're not in the thickness of it, but they're in the places where they're being challenged to say, is Christ going to be enough or is Christ going to need a, some form of top up? Like here's some airtime. So that's what really we are going to talk about for today. Let's just start at the beginning. So in this letter, if you read it, and I do hope you're going to read it, Paul starts, as he st- usually starts, by giving thanks for, to the, for this community. And so he says, grace and peace to you, my brothers and sisters, after he introduces himself. And he could do that classic Christian preacher thing. I could go line by line, you know, right? It's like for, and Paul says, greetings. Now, in Hebrew, what greetings mean, wow, you guys are taking me seriously. You're waiting to go, you know? You'll be happy to know. Uh, but no, no, no. Right? I, I have a much more important uh, commitment today. Not to teach you scriptures, but to get scriptures that work out their purposes within your life. So we're not going to go line by line as much as you love that. And so we're just going to focus on this one verse. And today, literally, again, and I'll come back to this idea is, you guys, and I don't know, like we, most of us come from big churches where pastors are nicely taken care of. In this small church, you guys do a bad job taking care of your pastor. Huh? So as a result of that, today is one of those mornings because I've been using my bag for something else. Literally, I have my iPad and my Bible just somewhere. Just like I got to church and I was like, oh my God, I forgot the Bible. The one day we're using the Bible. So it's not a reflection of my coolness that I'm referring to using my phone. I, it's just that, hey, we're hoping we grow so that then we can just be people who are like, do you have your Bible? You know? Anyway, so we go back to the letter. And Paul, one of the starting places we want to go is that as Paul is, is, is giving, I mean, so he greets the people, introduces himself as it were, and then he gives this, this, this like stab title, you know, Paul's like, like he's giving thanks for the community. And I was reading this portion literally a couple of weeks ago, and I couldn't move past this sentence because Paul says that we always, we always, I think it's on there. There you go. That we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, Lord, the love you have, you have for, all God's, for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard is the message of the gospel that has come to you. I mean, like, think about that. Like, Paul has never met the people in this community. This is not one of the communities he founded. It's founded by his friend Epaphras. So he has never met these people. So he is in prison amongst a bunch of other people. And I guess as he is in prison, Epaphras comes and he has news about this community of faith back home in a city called Colossae. And he's telling Paul, you know, like you can imagine this conversation goes on a number of days. Like, how did they get started? How did you gather the people? What led you to do something crazy like this? So then eventually it's like, and what is, how is the community like? How are they behaving, living? How are they receiving these words? And after all that introduction and history, when Paul finally comes to writing down, the thing that stands out about that particular community is simply is that these people have faith in Christ Jesus, and they have love for all of God's people and for one another, it says in another transition. And that faith and love is because of a hope they have stored up in heaven. Right? This idea of their faith is in Christ and their love for one another, all of that fired up from this idea that there is more life to come than what we see and interact with here and now. And I was thinking about that idea, that this is what this community is known for. And the thing about our communities of faith, however small or big they are, is that we are always known for something. 
And so I've been thinking this, I've been wrestling with this idea, like, what if someone was to come into Jani village and spend a couple of months amongst us, just living and being amongst us, and then they get a chance to meet with some guy in prison, and they are trying to say, what kind of a community we are? This is not one of those things that the pastor gets to write as a newsletter. You know, like the way you always pump up and peep the newsletter with the right photos and the right words. No, this is someone who has lived among the people and now he's just simply reporting to someone else. What would we be known for? What would we be known for? And all sorts of churches are known for all sorts of things. You know, we live in a genuinely Presbyterian uh, Presbyterian community area. And I keep more of us know the community is known for something. Their commitment and fidelity to following certain procedures and rules and ways of doing things, you know? Actually, my neighbor is a Presbyterian elder, so we get to spend some time with him. And he, like, he articulates this very well. But for him, if something happens, he knows exactly, you know, like you know what to do. You go to the right page of the right document and you follow, you just read through whatever. Like they have written everything imaginable. That's something to be proud of. They at least are known for that. I mean, a lot of us could not survive under such a regimented way of life, but for a lot of people, it's so life-giving that we know that when the guy stands there, he's just not standing there with some words. He's like some scripture that we was given by some people who sat down and prayed, and therefore he's preaching from that. It's amazing. Our mother church is growing increasingly in this city, ICC Nairobi, and it's being known for technological uh, all the ways that they leverage technology to share their good news. They are known for their eclectic worship style, as it were. They are known for something. And the thing about it is like, what are we going to be known for? But here's a big overwhelming challenge that I have. Is that for a lot of us in 2024, we are increasingly known less for our spiritual vitality, for our spiritual lives. We talk about communities that God is moving there because their numbers are growing. We talk about the community because partially maybe they're involved in some massive mission uh, outreach program. Maybe because they do some, but very little do we increasingly in 2024 talk about, but the people in that place are full of the faith in Christ. They love one another well and diligently. And they do those things of loving and, and, and putting their faith in Christ primarily because the hope they have in Christ is not something that just happens out there. It's something that actually is informing how their lives are lived here today. The question becomes, what community like us, what do we get known for? And that was something before, it's something we get known for out there. It's something that we know of ourselves in here. And it's just amazing because as human beings, you know, our natural proclivity, I love this idea of, um, I just was thinking like this idea, if someone watched our worship and the way we open ourselves up before the Lord, they say those are the people who have placed their trust in Christ. If the people looked at us and how we love one another in here, would they say that's a people who love one another because they know and it's just not all about everything that they have going on here and now. It's also what God has in store for them in the future. You know, I was thinking for a community like ours, are we known for something? Yeah, like I'm telling you, I'm your pastor, so it's going to come as awkward and I'm going to make a lot of you awkward. Right? The number of teams that I've met people who maybe their marriage is going through a dip or maybe whatever the thing is not working with them. How often I hear about these loving, amazing, adoring couples of Jane Village. Like they sit next to one another. They smile when they are told, turn to your neighbor. They look at each other. They look into each other's eyes. I mean, like they are just so loving. Munatupea pressure. I'm like, I kid you not. Like I hear, and the funny thing is like those couples are not even many in this community. But somehow like that becomes a thing that people say. And that appeals to a certain pressure. Oh my God, talk to those people about my challenges. Like, but they are so well put together. And then the weirdest thing about that is, of course, the couples themselves look among the rest of us and they're like, how unserious they are, these people. Now you see them, now you don't see them. What's going on? You know, and I'm like, but that's, I mean, I'm trying to say that that's natural human being. Literally, I was in a class this past week after not being in a class for ages. And our school is like tiny. So it's like at most like 30 people, as it were, and I like three different classes. And it's so funny, like every time we go to a place, we almost are looking around for who can I connect with here who is like me. 
We're just looking for ourselves. You know, it's not like that first day and then they serve tea at 10 30. It's awkward because all of, and we are all pastors, by the way. But we're just all like dancing around one another, saying hi, hi, you know. And then we learn, oh, you're from ICC. Ah, I used to go to ICC 80 years ago, but I used to go to ICC. Now we have something in common, so we can talk. But I'm telling you, we want that group of people day one. Because I'm introverted in spaces like this, I'm just a guy observing people and feeling awkward. Uh, by day three, you can almost tell who is with who together. Like the loud, vibrant people, they hang out together. I'm like, they are having so much time. Even me, I'm like, oh, man, I want to be with them. You know? I mean, the ladies who especially share certain traditional faith, I mean, they find affinity in one another, you know. There's always going to be the one or two influencers in the community. A community, like a guy like day one, we're all just awkwarding, taking tea, like we don't know one another. By day three, we're like bordered bodies. That's like natural for us as human beings. So I'm not saying that we need, we need to stop being that. I'm just simply saying that when we are in Christ, we are called to go beyond our natural human inclination. That it's possible to come into even a tiny community like this for years and never say hi to that person. Because that person doesn't seem like they belong to any of your connecting points. They're not married. They don't have a job. They don't A, B, C, D. Or they are married and they are sitting next to their wife and they look so happy together. I'm like, why would you ever want to talk to them? Or they have that car. I, like, literally, it's so weird. Like, but that's, not, that's like the beginning point. I'm not disputing that. We are not going to start somewhere else other than there. But here is the challenge that Christ gives us. He says, now you are one body. Like, you are one body. Like how are we going to be one body when we go on for year and year and year, creating narratives and stories about one another in our heads without ever being curious enough to know how is it going with you people? Right? The thing that I said about like the young, amazing, loving couple who sit next to us, it's so very weird that it's actually a stage thing. I mean, they are spiritual people. I love them. I know they love God. But it's also a season of life thing. They also don't have tiny little ones. I'm telling you, it's really hard. I learned it this morning. It's really hard to lift your hands up in abandon to Christ when you have a two-year-old who wants to jump on your very nice shoes. You're like, oh, God, stop. Hey, you're ruining my drip, you know? It's really hard. I mean, like literally, oh, my God, this pastor, she never even sits down to hear the word. Well, try having three little ones. So I mean, the funny thing is that we create, I'm trying to bust some idea that we create these stories about one another. And it turns out when these amazing, lovely couples were also having tiny little children, so are no different than you and I. So maybe they aren't as spiritual as much, as much as their season of life has changed. But no, 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 we will never move out our nicely created boundaries. And it doesn't matter whether we are 10, we are 20, literally whether we are even pastors. I'm telling you, I just come from witnessing this this past week. The challenge is, will you forever be stuck with your affinity group? Or will this idea of love going to transcend to move to the other? Imagine you showed up in church and you are intentionally curious about that person because you've seen them. Week in, week out, you just never say hi to them. Oh my God, caught up saying hi to them. And the weirdest thing is even now, we don't talk to them, we talk to one another about them. Like who knows a thing about them? Oh, you know them, really? Ah, So how did they end up in our church? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So the point I'm trying to make is a simple one. And when we're in Christ, the invitation is we're going to be known for something, but here's a challenge, that we are challenged to move beyond our natural affinity. So yes, you are always going to be drawn to your people. And that's like the gift of being human. It's amazing. It needs to be celebrated. But also, once in a space, we are called to transition and move towards one another with curiosity. And maybe you realize those young people have so much more in common than you would ever have thought. But especially for churches like ours, especially we in urban centers, I kid you not, as a pastor, unless I say this, it will be a church known for having a vibrant community where every Sunday everybody talks to their person. And you never realize this, of course, unless you are new. And I thought, wow, everybody here is taken. Even single people hang out, you know, with their gender. 
And some guy is just trying to get through and it's impossible. So I mean, the point is, all I have as your pastor is a prayer and a hope that we as a community, like we talked about in January, we will be known as a people who love lavishly. Like we love lavishly. We don't accommodate. We go out of our way to love one another, that we are generously present, that we are engaged participants. That's hoping that if our story was to ever be written, that's the words they're going to use. At this point, to be honest with you, it's just a prayer. And first, can you also stop hitting on the lovely couples who just sit next to one another? Wait for your season. It's coming also. You know, so anyway, after he says this, he moves on to other things now and like the end of embarrassing space. Now he moves to this amazing prayer. And this is what we are going to spend the rest of our time together for. Paul says in verse uh, 9 to 14 that for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all the power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. That's like one long sentence, you know? For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. And so like this prayer, it's like Richard, it's like such a big deal that I think this has been my prayer for you as I've been preparing and thinking about this community as we go through Ephesians. The first thing that Paul prays is that we will be filled with the will of God. We will be Filled, sorry, we'll be filled with the knowledge of God. We'll be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. And this is like a big deal, especially for us who are faithful for followers of Christ. And this big idea that in our Christian understanding that when you come to Christ for one mystical reason or another, the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you. Now, we hear that the Spirit comes and dwells with you. It doesn't sound like such a big deal, but here's what it gets crazier. Our understanding of who God is, is that our God is this mystery of three in one, that we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So when we say that we told the Spirit of God comes and lives in us, we are simply saying that a part of God comes and lives with us. Lives in us, rather. And as the God who created the universe, the God we read in the scriptures, the God that Jesus reveals in scriptures, the God who hangs on the cross, the God who releases the last breath and says it is finished, that that God wasn't, it wasn't enough for them to just stay over there, that they come and they make a dwelling inside of us. I mean, think about how crazy that is. And because this God comes and dwells within us, this God is also not neutral in their lives. That he has intentions, he has plans, he has purposes, he has a goal, like he is wanting to lead you to some place. And the thing that I'm trying to highlight here is that then when it comes to this prayer, oh, look at that child. The Spirit of God is moving through strongly. You, know? you see, the people uh, that are not sitting together like a loving couple. <laughs> idea, the bigger idea here is that when we say that, the, but I mean that you can know the will of God. It's just this idea of saying that there is within you a helper. Someone who wants to like guide you and lead you in the ways of God. And that there is in a very big deal a sense in which that we are free to choose whichever way we live. But here we are being invited to, we can seek and know the will of God. That somehow we can be filled with the full knowledge of the will of God. That's like something crazy. That the idea that God did not just create us and then left us and abandoned us, but that he has a very particular intention for our particular lives. So Paul prays that we will be filled with the full knowledge, not just a partial knowledge, not a drop of that knowledge, but full knowledge of the will of God. And that's amazing. Because I think, like, imagine that that should be our way of living. Imagine if we could make this our way of living. And as you look at your week that is coming up, you would pray, God, would, I, would you please fill me with the full knowledge of your will for my coming week? 
that I'll know what to prioritize and what to let go. As you go about living in a marriage relationship, you would ask God, would you fill me with the knowledge, with the full knowledge of your will within this particular season of a marriage life? That is, you parent. It will start here. I mean, I'll be the first one to say it doesn't start here most of the time. But it starts here. God, would you fill me with the food? I mean, imagine when Mokeni was just disturbing me. I was just like, oh, God. I will just say, God, would you please fill me with the knowledge of your will? To know how to respond within this particular moment. I think we get it with God's will when it's big things. God is like, should I move this place? Should I do this thing? Is this what you want me? But most of the times we neglect to think about this within the ordinariness of our lives. But the weird thing is that you don't live your life on very high, big, big moments. A lot of life is lived in just the messiness of day-to-day life, where we are juggling between the schedule and the current and annoying children and frustrating bosses and annoying work and not knowing what the next step and not even knowing that your life is counting for something. But here is what Paul is trying to say that even there you can know that you can be filled with the knowledge of God's will here and now. That that's something that is available to you. But that's not our starting point. There is our future reaching. You know, that's not our starting point. Most of the times we just do life. If anything like me, you come out of here like Sunday afternoon is just a day for catching a nap and then you rest a bit and then tomorrow you wake up and you just go. So it's not like even like we pray for this. It's like it's just not that we don't even pray for these things. Most of the times we don't even pray for our normal day-to-day life. Paul is saying that when we don't do that, we miss out on a dramatic gift that is there for us, a resource that is there for us, that you can know the full will of God's purposes for your life here and now. So the bigger question is, how come we don't pray this prayer? And a lot of answers could go into this, but I just want to highlight on three that I think are most particular to our community, maybe four. But the first one is what a, a, a theologian scholar writer says it calls functional atheism. Functional atheism. And functional atheism, he says, is it's an unconscious, unexamined conviction that if anything decent is going to happen, a conviction held even by people who talk a good game about God. But do you hear that part? That if anything decent is going to happen here, we're the ones who must make it happen. And the thing about that is like you have atheists. I mean like atheists believe that there's no God. And if there's a God, then maybe we don't have to need, we don't need to have a relationship with that particular God. So they live their ways, they live their lives as if they have the final word and authority on their word. And that's a choice that they make. But imagine now us who claim and hold on to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When we don't reach out to God, when we don't open ourselves up, when we don't seek to know His will for our lives, then the question becomes, we are simply atheists who just have a God that we hold on to, but function primarily as a people disconnected from that God. I think about that. We just wake up and go and live our lives. And most of the times we just live our lives as good as if God doesn't exist. Of course, until something dramatic happens and we wake up and we snap back in and we say, wait, 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 God, I am here. And you pray like crazy, like I've said before, to get a job. But as soon as you get that job two months in, you are on. You are cruising. You are doing big things. God, please leave me alone. I got it from here. But the challenge is, what if God has an intent and purpose for that? And so it's so much so that in our lives, the Holy Spirit has to keep redirecting our lives. He has to keep coming in the way and interjecting and bringing us back in a particular direction because for so most of the times, we are just swinging for the aces. So functional atheism. But then there's another one, which is fear. And with fear, the thing here is, but what would God allow if I truly pray for his will to be revealed to me? Like what if you asked me to go to Somalia? I don't know if you're the guys who are like, we are always grew up scared of being called to go to Somalia. Like what if he calls me to go there? What if God calls me to leave my job? What if God calls me to sell my car? Sell my car? What was his business giving it to me in the first place, you know? 
What if God asks me to actually give some more money than what I have already planned? No, 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 God, we have a budget near to the T. Please just live your life and I live my life. And can we just all move on? At least I'm not living in sin. I'm just living my life. And I go to church. Oh, we have this fear. But if you interrogate that sense of fear that we have, like the bigger question there is that we carry this image of a sadistic evil God. And I mean those words intentionally. Sadistic evil God who cannot wait to ruin your life. Like if you truly prayed for him and trusted him to bring a, part, a life partner alongside you, he's going to bring the person you would never have chosen. And of course, we have done a terrible job about this. We who have been following Christ because anything terrible happens to us is very quickly outsourced to God. Oh, but you know, I'm just doing this because God asked me to. If it wasn't God, I wouldn't be doing this. Oh, and things are going well. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I know what I'm doing, you know? So you have fear in it. The other thing is, and this one, like very, very personal to me, is past silence from God. Like there was a season where you sought God's will. Like you surrendered, you fasted, you prayed, and all you had was nothing. I don't know if any of you have had an experience like this. This happens, especially for those of us who come from university and colleges. You're like desperate, like, God, what should I do with my life? What should I do? What should I do? And then like, it's just like silence. And then when it's silence long enough, you just decide, I might as well do whatever comes next. But also, it's just not that. It's also in very hurtful moments. There are places that you have, in, you have trusted God will like to come and heal someone. And that person was not healed. And God was silent. And you are raving. Or you lost your job in the most unexpected spot. So you got a job that you were so sure God led you there. And then it backfired. And you are just done. Past a silence from God. And before you know it, what ends up happening is that then we just slowly, leave, we and God just separate and go different ways. You know, men, I don't know, men, men at the journey village are a lot better than I am. But I, you know, now I've gotten, I have matured so much more. But you know, I'm married in earlier days when Buzon would just challenge me to something. I would just like stonewall her. I would just like go mute, you know? I just focus on my computer and watch my movie as if it's like the most important thing ever. And I was still in ministry, just so you know. But the thing about it is, right, I was just stone wall. And then my wife would just be like, so are we going to stay here waiting for a stone to speak or should we just move on with life? So at some point she figured out this is not working, trying to get this guy to talk. So she just did life. And then I guess the man caught up with her later. I think most of the times we are like that with God. We just barely pray. God, what's your will here? Like we know, like we are cruising because you have been silent and I even be, most of us will be shocked if actually God spoke. Like for what? You actually had a will and a purpose? And then the last one, because I don't want to spend entire time there, is like this idea of perceived naivety. And perceived naivety is such a big deal, especially for people like us who have gone to college and gotten educated. We can speak English, oh my God. Oh my, to be naive is almost like the worst thing possible in our generation. Maybe not yours, but in my generation. What do you mean? Like you're still praying for God's will? Have you done the thing? And I'm not saying that those are always intention. I'm just saying that also a lot of times the praying for God's will becomes an excuse not to do the thing. But I'm also saying that for those of us who are very gifted at doing things, to say that you are seeking God's will for your job, we are being naive. We just expect you to be a teacher. So show up in school and do the teaching. And there's a thing to that, but a lot of times there's this idea of we don't want to look weak. And so what we do is we just power through. We don't have time to wait on God. But here's what I want to keep saying back over to you again. What if in our living the life the way we have chosen to live is we are living apart from a vast resource that is available from us, from a vast less place that is available from, to us, from a vast renewing and resourcing that is available to us because we have sensed and had God's will. The only way we can, I can rally a community of, I think at that point, maybe a hundred people to go out in the world and try to raise money so that we can have a facility like this is simply because I've had God's will. Otherwise, it's madness. So it just shocks me when we can do life for the longest time possible without having this idea of 
God's way. So Paul, knowing these people, he desires more than anything that they will be filled with the knowledge of God's way. And that's my prayer for you, that you will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. But then Paul continues. And this is why we're not going to spend a lot of time because, I mean, we have come over here over and over. This idea of being strengthened with power. Like almost the past three Sundays, we have touched on something to do with power. That then... Pray for you to be filled with the, uh, with the full knowledge of the will of God, but also to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. And this is a really big deal because Paul almost knows something like we've been talking about, that as human beings, there comes a time when you get weak, when you get tired, when you get wiry, it just gets to that point when you run, you get to the end of your resources, the end of your network, the end of your uh, whatever it is that was strengthening you. And we have talked about this before. The idea that we need to long for those moments, not to give up, but to be strengthened with the power that comes from God, that this gift that God gives of power. But also I want you to hear what Paul is talking about because he has a very specific intention when he talks about us being strengthened. And it is that we will be strengthened with power. And also that we can rise up after we have been uh, we have fallen down so that we can now charge through life as it were. Is that so we will be filled and strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience. This line was going so well until he added those two last words. And so that we may have great endurance and patience. Don't you not like how scripture turns and turns things? Because I want power. But power to endure and to be patient? Not me. It's Eugene Peterson, the amazing scholar who said that, pastor scholar who said that, other amazing pastor scholar who said that, we live in an impatient shortcut, addicted culture. Impatient, unfortunately, is antithetical to the Christian way. But that's the world we live in. This is not something you take into your corporate responsible job. Like patience is not one of the virtues that we articulate within our offices. No, 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 no. We want things done. And because we live into the world, then it's very easy for that to transcend into every other arena of our lives. We want this facility done and done like yesterday. But we can just move on with it. But another church father, and there are people like those, like this is Asian church fathers called Tertullian. Tertullian had this to say that impatient is as it were the original sin in the eyes of the Lord. Those are big words to say. Impatient is as it were the original sin in the eyes of the Lord. For to put it in a nutshell, every sin is to be tracked back to impatience. I find the origin of impatience in the devil himself. That this thing that we have come to embrace and celebrate within our culture is so much. When it moves from that place of the workplace that we need to be effective and efficient, and it moves to be the defining mark of our lives, unfortunately, it becomes the orig our original sin. And if we were to really analyze, wouldn't we agree that this impatience is what lies at the heart of so much of today's addiction? It's what lies at so much of today's um, betting crisis. That we want things and we want them now. Isn't it the very thing that is eating at our nation as we speak with corruption? I want things and I want them now and it doesn't matter who gets hurt in the process. Is that what the crisis of fertilizer that we are talking about in our country is about? Some person wants to get rich at, no, at whatever cost possible very, very fast so that I guess they are ready for 2027. We are impatient. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about in here, within our lives. A lot of times we want God to restore and do things so quickly within ourselves. We want everything solved within a day or two. Eugene Peterson concludes by saying or continues to say that my patient is a difficult, but patient is a difficult condition to come to terms with in a technological, in a technology saturated culture and a corrupt culture like the one we live in, that is impatient and contentious of slowness. If you are slow, we look down on you with so much vigilance. And as a consequence, patient is the first thing discarded in spiritual formation. And then what happens is we discover that the faster we move, the more we try to fit in, the less we become. I mean, think about that. That the faster we go, the less we become. 
that speed as a matter of fact diminishes us. Think about that. And you don't have to think about that. You just need to look at the cultures that have perfected all sorts of resources and tools that help people to move further faster. And instead of those sources, those cultures being marked and defined by fullness of life, they are marked by so much anxiety and worry and fear and all this. Hey, my wife works in a community which is dominated by people who come from a very dominant culture. You know, they have the resources. Their very upbringing says things need to happen now. You know those communities where we ask you, so what do you need to just get this thing done? And actually we give you what you need, you know? But the years and years and years of living in that culture, it makes them so anxious, so frustrated. An email is delayed by two minutes, you start panicking. And it's going like, why are you guys living so much on the edge where you have so much going for you? I guess us? Like, oh, the email hasn't been received. I guess maybe a kuna stima call. What do you mean, Akuna Stima? You know, get a generator, you know? But the thing about it, because we are being formed, the faster, farther we can go, the better, more we will be. The truth is, unfortunately, because what is very good at our workplace, again, is very rarely transferable to our lived lives. No marriage gets healed faster. It takes time. No deep healing of our soul traumas happening in an instance. Let me do therapy for five sessions and be done. It takes years. So you can imagine we live in a culture that tells us everything. I'm not kidding you. I'm like just 40 and I can't tell you the amount of pressure I feel that I haven't secured a property for my family. Because I'm like, I could die tomorrow. You're 40, man. And the thing about it is, because God hasn't blessed me with that, then I start living with so much deep anxiety, like, oh my God, God, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? There's literally no room to wait on God. So then Paul is onto something when he says that he's praying that we'll be given power according to the glorious might of God so that we will have great endurance and patience. Imagine if we became a community defined by great endurance and patience the healing you hope in your marriage is going to come, just not tomorrow. But the very big things that you're trusting God for are going to come, just not tomorrow. And in the meantime, you live in the tension of being patient and enduring. So I do know that some of us, we came here almost at the end of our rope. Like we are almost this close to done. Sign it in, phone it in, just be done. And here's my prayer for you. May you be filled with the power of Christ to have great endurance and patience. And so finally, Paul concludes this portion of prayer by praying that these people will be, then have a joyful thanks. Joyful thanks. And he says that, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of uh, in the kingdom of God. There's one of those like Paul being ahead of his time because now we have so much data that tells us that if you live a life defined by gratitude, then you have a certain level, like you have so much more aligned to you. Your brain gets literally rewired. Your body gets to rest as it were. You get more to live more into the fullness of who God created you simply by living a life defined by joyful thanks. Now, now Paul is also going this further because he simply says the reason we give thanks is that Christ has qualified us to share in the, inherit in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of right. And this is like such a big deal. Now, I don't know which community you come from, but I come from a place in Moranga where pieces of land are becoming tiny and tiny and tiny and tiny and tiny. And therefore, we are looking at it and saying what was defined as inheritance. And now we are wondering, do you want to actually divide this piece of land even further? But no, 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 no. The thing about it is that God is saying that there's an inheritance for you that is any dependent on the large resource available to you. Now, as an only child, like I've told you, and who lost their mother sometimes, but this is one of those things that I get back to because for a lot of my friends, they have a fallback plan. You can always go back home. It's going to be 10 acres that is left to you or something else like that, you know? And all of a sudden, it's God, like I say, God, but where is my inheritance? I'm so grateful for this verse that says, 
Jesus, I mean, God the Father qualifies us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. But here's the bigger news. This is that aren't you glad that it's actually God the Father who qualifies us and not a pastor like me? And I don't get to qualify you to share in the inheritance that God has for you. Aren't you glad that it's God the Father who qualifies you and not yourself? Just for all the shame and guilt we feel, most of us, we will just edit ourselves off from whatever God has in store for us. Aren't you glad that it's not the quality of your life that qualifies you? It's not how bright or not bright you are. It's not whether you have a great job or don't have a great job. Whether you have a family or no family. That none of those things qualify you. It's God the Father who qualifies you to share in the inheritance. Isn't that something? But not only that, he says that this God we give thanks because not only he's the one who qualifies us to share in the inheritance of his holy people, it also continues to say, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That there was something like, yeah, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. And not only does this God the Father qualify you and I, it's also that in Christ that we receive forgiveness of sin. And again, you say a word like that in a community like that, and it doesn't register much. But here is a bigger deal that we are gathered here as a people who carried all sorts of burdens into church today. Maybe for you, it's like the brokenness, a very new brokenness in your life. Maybe for you, it's all the ways you have tried to make yourself right and things are not aligning. If for you, you're just sitting there and saying, like, if they just knew where I was yesterday or this past week, they would never allow me into their space. If for you, it's not just the things you've done, it's like the shame that you carry that continues to define you, that even in spaces like this, instead of occupying space as one of the people in this community, in this body of Christ, you are forever looking for the largest, farthest, marginalized corner to be in. But here is the good news, that for you, Christ Jesus exists, died, went to the cross and rose again, so he could forgive the sin. You don't have to live in that burden anymore. And so as I invite the worship team back up, He's like, really, where I wanted to learn this whole long conversation. And it's in this idea of my prayer for you. I'm praying this prayer for this community for the past couple of weeks. That the Lord, God, will fill you with all. Will fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. There's just someone here who longs to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God for this particular season in their life. Is there someone who is open enough to sense that sense of God saying, this is what I am doing here and now. Maybe it's just all chaos and darkness and you can't see anything. And God is saying, if you open up yourself to me, I can fill you up with the knowledge of what my will is for your life. 